Okay, mapping with one variable. We're gonna talk through some of the options for mapping one variable, and I'm gonna show you some, uh, some cool maps. Okay, core pleth maps. We've talked about these um, before. You guys know what they are. You've made many of them, uh, I'm sure. The most common thematic map used. It makes perfect sense to assign um, the value associated with the place, um, broken into some neat little classification scheme, assigned a color ramp, um, classic way to map a variable. So I, I need to say this because this is sort of a, uh, a caveat that goes with core pleth maps, but I think we abuse this all the time, but it's probably worth saying. Core pleth maps make more sense when the data is tied to the enumeration unit. So it makes the most sense to map things that actually relate to the boundary, the whether it's a state or a county. Um, you want to be careful mapping things like soil type because soil type isn't has nothing to do with this outline. Disease. Disease isn't bounded by a state outline, right? I mean, it's affected by people, where people are, cities, straddle. And this, when you use a core pleth map like this, it, it makes you feel like, oh no, something is very different between Minnesota and North Dakota, um, whereas the values might be exactly the same in this whole region. So you just have to be really careful about stuff like that. Um, okay, the rules to follow, three, it's actually just two. Um, number one, use rates or ratios. You can't map raw counts like population with a core pleth map. That is actually incorrect. It's like starting a bar chart um, with some value other than zero. And then a uh, rule of thumb is just three to seven classes. Keep it simple, but not too simple. All right, unclassified core pleth maps. This is actually a great thing to do. There's no reason not to. Um, you don't always have to classify. So um, we did just talk about classification methods uh, twice, but what if you just plopped it up like this? So um, one stretched color ramp, all of your different data observations, not broken into natural, you know, Jenks breaks or quantile or equal interval, but just allowed to uh, attach to the color ramp from wherever the distribution of the data is sitting. Nothing wrong with that. The good things about it um, is that you don't have to classify. So we aren't introducing some bias there. We aren't hiding any of the data um, and we aren't making mistakes by classifying incorrectly. Uh, we don't risk losing, um, you know, losing the visibility of any of our data. The data is, can just speak for itself. Um, we can see subtle differences uh, between places if they have very similar differences in value. And then, um, it's a great way of showing the overall spatial distribution. But some of the cons are that often the data has too much to say. Classifying lets us simplify, get rid of the noise a little bit. So when you wanna simplify the message, um, classifying is a good idea and not using a stretched color ramp. Um, it's also very hard, like we've talked about, for humans to differentiate between subtle variations in color. And so it would be really difficult for your audience to look at the map and then go over here and try and figure out um, what the actual values are. So the cognitive load is much higher. Uh, and then lastly, uh, they don't print or transfer well. So you sort of lose the fidelity of the colors. Um, it might be really easy to read on your computer screen, but when you go to print it, you lose all that um, detail in the graduation between, say, white and dark green. Okay, so in summary for choropleth maps, um, you can use unclassed when you don't want to simplify or filter the data. Um, you can also use unclassed choropleth maps if um, you can't find a suitable classification method. Um, if you're just trying to give an overview of the geographic patterns, unclassed makes good sense. Um, but if you want your reader to be able to extract actual numbers or even a ballpark of a number, like numbers within a class, then you're gonna to wanna to classify. Okay, alternatives, what else can we do? 
Well, we can use proportional symbols or graduated symbols. We can use dot density, cartograms, and all three of those can handle counts and totals. So you aren't restricted to converting things, standardizing or normalizing. So proportional symbols scale the size of a very simple symbol like a circle to the value at that location. So it's a, that's why it's called proportional. And that's really important. We've talked about this in um, earlier lectures um, that the size needs to proportionally represent the value. So it's a very easy concept to grasp, right? But you have to be careful. It's the whole area. And we've talked about that. It's difficult for humans to compare areas and extract um, accurate you know, numeric differences from uh, different areas. When you classify a proportional symbol map, that's what a graduated symbol map is. Graduated symbol maps aren't proportional anymore. Once you classify it, um, you lose that proportionality. You can still graduate, but it's up to the user to define the min-max size of the symbols. So it's a little bit different. Um, so you can use this for either ordinal data or straight continuous numeric data. Um, it's definitely easier to decode than dot density, and we'll talk about those in just a second. Um, it detaches from the size of the enumeration unit. So if you're dealing with a census block or a county or a state, um, you, aren't, you aren't beholden to that, uh, the area or the size of the enumeration unit, which is nice. That's how you can get away with um, plotting up just like population counts or sums. Okay, so um, we can do this either with a single symbol or we can use proportional symbols multivariable. And that's moving ahead a little bit. I've got a whole different set of slides on uh, multivariable plotting. But um, obviously you could, there's no reason you couldn't do something like this, right? Uh, it's just a fun thing to experiment with. Experiment with the transparency, with the layer orders, um, how you're filling them. And you can actually encode quite a lot of data on a map this way. All right, but just remember a couple of the things we've talked about, like um, uh, the Ebbinghaus illusion, how these two orange circles that are the exact same size don't look the same size because of uh, the size of the symbols surrounding them. So it does make, um, well, it makes it a little tricky to uh, go back and forth between the sizes of the um, dots on the map and any kind of a legend if you're dealing with a graduated symbology. Um, yep, a lot of variation in values. Um, sometimes the large, if you've got a, a big variation um, in your range of values, sometimes the large circles get so big that it'll end up covering, covering the whole map. And that's kind of a, that's kind of a, a problem. And we end up usually going to some kind of a classification so we can graduate them um, and reduce the maximum size of the symbols a little bit. Um, yeah, it, we do have issues when we're dealing with overlap, so you can fix that using transparency. You could manually move the symbols, but you don't want to dissociate it from the location that it's supposed to be representing. Whoops. And like we know, people don't estimate area very well. So if this square represents a thousand people, how big would you say this square is? How many people does this represent? How many times bigger is this square than this one? It's 36 times bigger. So this would represent 36,000 people, um, and that's not an easy comparison for people to make, but it does show spatial distribution really well. Okay, um, I'm just reading through here. Classify and use a few discrete symbol sizes. The loss of fidelity in the data is made up for with fewer map reading errors. So that's really true. Um, and then remember that when you classify, it's very subjective. How many classes, what method are you going to use? Um, all of these things introduce a little bit of uh, error and a slight degradation of our data. Dot density maps. This is another alternative to Choropleth if you want to deal with raw counts, uh, populations, things like that. This is a map of U.S. lightning deaths between 2007 and 2017. And you might think that just because you live in Florida, there's something about you that makes you more susceptible to being struck by lightning and killed. And that's not true. So this is another problem with these, these boundaries, right? Um, we, we introduce these kind of artificial artifacts 
um, that savvy people have to be savvy and read and realize that okay there isn't something magical about utah and arizona and there isn't something magical about nevada and this this border so dot densities each dot represents either an observation or a set of observations um but the the well and i'll get into this but the biggest problem is they aren't placed at the location that the observation is made so if you just know that there's a certain number of things happening in Montana, um, and this is your enumeration unit, the, the dots are going to be randomly distributed around the state. So they're not put where, you'd, where the, the thing happened. Dots are distributed to maximize coverage within the enumer enumeration unit. Um, and if you're working with a good algorithm, it'll make sure not to put the dots on things that don't make sense, like lakes or unpopulated areas. You can sometimes create a mask that will prevent the dots from being pla uh, placed in certain places. Okay, so it's good because you can map raw counts, population totals, etc. You can also map rates and ratios, so it's very flexible and it, um, it isn't tied to color. It, it translates to black and white very well, so you can desaturate this and you don't lose the meaning. Um, it's great for overall sense of spatial distribution, but again, it's tied to the enumeration unit. So you want to go, um, the ideal thing is if you're making a map of the United States, but you have county level data, that, that's kind of a best case scenario because then um, when you're zoomed out and looking at the whole state, let me see if this one's any better. Now these are all kind of state level uh, distributions of dots, you can tell. There aren't clusters within each state. That's kind of a, a better case scenario. Okay, so uh, yeah, limitations to dot density. Obviously, it's impossible to retrieve actual numbers from the map. map. People aren't going to sit here and count how many dots are in California. So it's just good for showing patterns. Um, you could get over that by adding labels to the map if you wanted to. But most importantly, the dots are distributed randomly. Um, your reader might not know that and infer that the dots are mapping observed locations or actual locations, and they're not. It's a random distribution um, within the area uh, that the observations are mapped to. Yeah, that's it is really unfortunate, I think. Okay, another alternative, cartograms. Uh, so choropleth maps, you use color to encode the value of that location, but in a cartogram, the, the area of the location is changed to encode that value. There's two different kinds. There's contiguous and non-contiguous. This is a non-contiguous map where they're allowed to, the pieces are allowed to break apart from each other. So the overall, um, the overall shape is preserved, but the individual areas are adjusted. Like the, the value that's being measured is being reflected by the area. Um, a contiguous means the boundaries have to stay locked together so that you get that warping and that twisting. So this is billionaires per state. Notice it's a raw count. It's not a rate. It's not the percent of billionaires per state. It's just a raw number. Um, I think this is worth pointing out that these are labeled both with the state name and the number. I think that helps because if you aren't familiar with the original geometry of the United States, sometimes you might lose track of, of what these locations are. Uh, this is the number of mountaineering accidents per year, so it makes perfect sense that the mountain states are uh, blowing up and the Midwest has shrunk to almost nothing. Weird classification scheme, though. Um, you know, here in the Midwest, it's obviously zero because there aren't any mountains, but because there are quote unquote mountains out on the East Coast, but it's still in that lowest class. So I think this is a, a pretty wonky uh, classification scheme. We don't even see any red. Why would you do that? Okay, so um, alternatives to cartograms. Um, I'm just going to throw these at you. You can think about them. Uh, electro, uh, the Electoral College cartogram, so taking hexagons to represent the number of electoral votes. Um, it's still roughly in the shape of the United States. This is a great way to show um, that value. There are lots of variations on this. This one is actually made in Tableau, I believe. Um, oh, this, is, this one's animated. Oh, you can change it to hexagons. Very nice. Ooh, 
Very nice. Okay, all sorts of alternatives. So cartograms, take home messages, use them sparingly. Um, use them when you have unexpected size disparities between locations, okay? They can be engaging and memorable. They're catchy and fun, but the audience needs to be familiar with the original geography or they really don't make any sense. I've had students make these um, with the counties of Utah, and unless you are very, very familiar with a county map, uh, they have almost no meaning once you're done with them. Uh, they can be seen as incorrect because the distortion appears accidental. It, it looks a little silly sometimes. They can be seen as cartoonish um, and, and therefore taken less seriously. Um, it's obviously very difficult for people to estimate the areas because not only have we lost the intuitive shape, but now they're very, very distorted, kind of stretched, wonky areas um, and impossible, therefore, to extract actual values from the map. Um, and then last but not least, I just want to talk about legends um, a little bit more. First rule of legends is obviously to not use one if direct labels can be used. So like in this example on the top, um, just go ahead and label the lines directly. Um, by repeating the color up in the title, we've um, kind of redundantly encoded the color and we're forcing the audience to focus specifically on these two countries, even though um, we've mapped, you know, 10 countries here. Um, and then the other thing that I've mentioned before, but the idea of um, orienting your legend in the same direction that the data is being displayed. So in Tableau, it might spit out agree, disagree. Take the time to rotate that to reduce that cognitive load and make it unify with the data presentation. Okay, that's it.